Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for such a day like this. This is the day you've made and we'll be glad and rejoice in it in Jesus' name. Thank you because we know that you make all things beautiful. And as we come to this study today, we pray, O oh Lord, that there will be nothing to hinder us from getting the best from your word in Jesus' name. Grant us the spirit of understanding and a spirit of knowledge that your watch will be truthful and your watch will be made plain and clear to every heart tonight in Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. Be a blessing. We pray that the message today will be a blessing to every heart in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name, we pray. <coughs> We come to our study tonight, and in our study tonight, we're still looking at the message of Christ to the churches. You know, if you've been here with us, that we have seven churches of Asia Minor, that the Lord Jesus Christ had been sending messages to. But as he sent the messages to the seven churches in Asia Minor, at the end of every message, he said, Him that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. That tells us immediately that the message of Christ to the churches, to those seven churches, is not just to those seven churches. It is to all the churches of the present church age until Christ will come. Already we have studied five of those messages. And today we come to number six. And it is a message of the Lord Jesus Christ to the church in Philadelphia. Please open your Bible with me to Revelation chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 7. Revelation chapter 3, reading from verse 7. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, This thing says he that is holy, he that is true, he that has the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man shall, no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and thou hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews, and are not. But do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell on the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast, which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God. And the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh out of heaven from my God. And I will write upon him my new name. And then he concludes, he that has, and he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. As we look at the church today, that is the church of Philadelphia, that Jesus Christ was writing to. You will see that it was a unique church. As you look at the seven churches, you'll we'll find that there were only two of the seven churches that were so faithful, so righteous, and so holy, and so God-honoring, and Christ-pleasing, that Christ had nothing at all to say against them. Of the rest, five, he had a lot to say against those other five. But for the church of Smyrna and Philadelphia, these are good samples to follow. There are some things for us to notice. Number one, because we have seven churches, that's a complete sample of all the kinds of churches that will be all through the church age. That is, any church from the time that Christ rose from the dead until Christ will come again. Any church can find its picture in any in one of these seven churches. Another thing we understand is that Christ evaluates every church. Because in every church he said, I know your works, I know your deeds, I know your life. And nothing can be hidden away from me. Which means then, the evaluation of Christ, although different from the evaluation of men and women around us, that's the evaluation that is eternally valuable. All the self-praise, 
all the praise of the public, all the praise of society concerning any church will be nothing, will fade into insignificance on the final day when Jesus Christ says, although the society praises you, although you praise yourself, although other churches comparing themselves with you, they think you are a great church, but I know your works. And then he begins to point out the things that were hidden in that church. Understand that in the Christian life too, it is the evaluation of Christ that is eternally valuable. As you find that there were only two out of seven that were faithful, that's what you still find even today, that only the minority of Christians and the minority of churches are faithful and loyal and dependable and they are devoted unto the Lord completely without any rebuke, without any sin, without any evil that is hidden in their hearts. As you look at all the churches, you'll understand that the majority of the churches in these chapters 2 and 3 of Revelation, the majority they were faithful. They allowed sin. They allowed compromise. They allowed evil in their midst. It's exactly the same thing you have today. As you are walking by, you may pass more than five churches before you find a church that is really preaching the truth. A church that is standing on the watch of God. The majority of churches, like the majority of Christians, are unfaithful, unprepared, undependable, and in the sight of the Lord, they do not have a good record. But it should be our desire, it should be your desire that like the church in Smyrna, the church in Philadelphia too, you will be a church, you will be a Christian that Christ will look at and he says, I'm pleased with you. I'm happy with you. And then he gives you an evaluation that you yourself will be happy about. This church in Philadelphia received commendation. Received encouragement without any blame, without any correction, without any condemnation from Christ. And you understand the way Jesus introduced himself. He who is holy and he who is true. And you, you think about it, he who is holy and who is true did not find anything unholy, anything unrighteous, anything untrue in their midst. The righteous, impartial judge was so pleased with that church that all that he had for them was greater privilege of more usefulness in ministry. These two churches, the church of Smyrna and the church in Philadelphia, commended by Christ, they had no moral flaw. And they had no blemish at all spiritually. And there was no doctrinal error for Jesus Christ to correct. Isn't that an encouragement for you and for me? Isn't that a hope for any church that if these two churches can be without moral flaw? can be without spiritual blemish, can be without doctrinal error, it is possible for you and it's possible for the church to be without anything that Jesus will look at and that he will not be happy with. In fact, as you think about the church, isn't that the very goal of the Lord Jesus Christ, the purpose of Jesus and the provision of Jesus Christ, he said, is holy and true. And what are we told in the book of Romans, in chapter 11, it says, if the root is holy, then the branches are holy too. If the head of the church is holy, then the body, the body must be holy. That is the body of Christ. As you look at the church, you find that this is what the Lord is calling the church to, to be holy and to be true, to be truthful and to be righteous. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15, but I see, which has called you is holy. So be ye holy in all manner of conversation because it is written, be ye holy for I am holy. Because Christ is holy, the church must be holy. Because Christ, the head of the church, is righteous and pure. Without any blemish and without any blame, the church too must be holy and righteous and pure without any blame. And also that the church must be truthful, that he is a Christian. Because it is the Christians that make up the church. If the church is going to be truthful, then the Christian too must be truthful. In Philippians chapter 4 verse 8, Philippians 4 verse 8, finally brethren, whatsoever things are true, Whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. That's what the Christian ought to be. And that's what the church ought to be. At least the head of the church is like that. And the church in Smyrna was like that. The church in Philadelphia was like that. The church of today, depending upon the sufficient, abundant grace of God, can be like that as well. That we are truthful and we are holy at the same time. In Ephesians chapter 4, it tells us what the Christian ought to be and by extension, by implication, what the church ought to be. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 15 was speaking the truth in love. 
may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. It says the truth should be so central, should saturate the life of the believer and saturate the lives of the church as well, that will speak the truth in love. And then you go on to verse 23 and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And that she put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. There's the truth on the one hand, there's the holiness on the other hand. And the provision that the Lord has made is that every one of us, everyone that is called by the name of Christ should be holy, should be righteous, should be truthful and loyal, faithful to the Lord. In Luke chapter 1, verses 74 and 75, that he would grant unto us that's the provision of the Lord. And that's why Jesus Christ went to the cross of Calvary. He that is holy, he that is true, wants to reproduce that holiness in you and in me. He wants to reproduce that truthfulness in you and in me. That's why that he will grant unto us that we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our lives. I'm sure you know this passage in, in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 through to uh, 27. It shows very clearly the, the, uh, the purpose of Christ for the church and the provision of Christ for the church. It says, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for each, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. There should be no doubt in anyone's mind that Jesus as is holy and true. He wants the church to be holy and to be true as well. In First Timothy chapter 3 verse 15. First Timothy chapter 3 verse 15. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know that thou, how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God. That church is supposed to be the pillar and the ground of truth. The pillar and the ground of truth. And you will see then the plan of God for the church, the purpose of God for the church. And isn't it wonderful and beautiful that the church in manner fitted into the purpose of Christ for the church. And the church in Philadelphia also fitted into the purpose of Christ for the church. The compromise you'll find in other churches, the, cor the corruption you'll find in other churches, you don't find in Smyrna and Philadelphia. The decline of the first love or the inroad of idolatry and immorality through the corrupting influence of Jezebel that you find in some other churches you don't find in the church in Smyrna in the church in Philadelphia how about the deception of false doctrine and the deeds of Balaam and the Nicolaitans no, not in Philadelphia not in Smyrna how about the association and interaction with false world religions and a compromise and toleration of sin and false prophets that Jesus will say, I have something against you. That you have all those people there that hold the deeds of the doctrine and the deeds of the Balaam and Nicolaitans. But in the case of Smyrna, you cannot find that. In the case of Philadelphia, you cannot find that. And then the fear of suffering persecution that made some people to be unfaithful. You cannot find in these two faithful, pure, Christ-honoring and God-exalting churches. And the lukewarmness you'll find in Laodicea, you cannot find in this church here. That's why as you look at this church in Philadelphia, and you see what Jesus Christ is saying, I know your words. You're expecting that you will say, you're good here, you're good here, but I have something against you. You don't find a negative note in the evaluation of Jesus Christ concerning this church at all. Let's now look at the church itself. Look at the whole message that the Lord is giving us through the church in Philadelphia. We divide the message into three parts. Number one, Christ's perfection, power, and characteristics. Christ's perfection, power, and and characteristics number two the christian's purity perseverance and consecration then number three the conqueror's position as a pillar and his crown let's go back to number one it says christ's perfection power and characteristics in revelation chapter three 
reading from verse 7. Here we find the Lord Jesus Christ first introducing himself to the church. That's what he did in every church. In speaking to that church, he'll say, I am such and such. And then he will not simply say, I'm just Jesus Christ. He will describe himself. And by his attributes and characteristics, you'll know that it's Christ, the head of the church, that is speaking. Look at it in Revelation chapter 3, verse 7. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia. I've said that before. We need to say that again. The angel here, the angelos is the messenger of the church. Is the leader in that church. Is a shepherd in that church. It says to the pastor, the preacher, the shepherd of the church in Philadelphia. Right. These things says, to, says, says he that is holy and he that is true. He that has the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. Can you see some five things there about the Lord Jesus Christ? Number one, he that is holy. Number two, he that is true. Number three, he that has the key of David. And he, does, he doesn't just keep that key in the pocket somewhere. He does something with it. Number four, he that openeth and no man shutteth. Number five, he that shutteth and no man openeth. That's the description that Jesus Christ gives about himself. Now, as Jesus said, he that is true and he that is holy. Do you understand that that, uh, that phrase, he that is holy and true, or true and holy, or righteous and true, is used concerning the Almighty God? As you look at the book of Revelation, you'll find that that is referring to the Almighty God himself. In Revelation chapter 6, verse 10, look at it. And he cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true. You see, they were talking to the Almighty God and they used those attributes, holy and true. If you look at chapter 15 and verse 3, chapter 15 of Revelation verse 3, and they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty, just and true. Just and true are thy ways. That is holy and true. In Revelation chapter 16 verse 7, it says, I had another out of the altar say, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous, true and holy, are thy judgments. And you look at uh, Revelation chapter 19, the first part of verse 2. For true and righteous, true and holy are his judgments. Uh, that, that reminds you of what Jesus said when he said, I and my father are one true and holy, holy and true. As that is referring to God Almighty, to the Father himself, it also refers to the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, he's the true one and he's the holy one. Pick them up one by one. Number one, that he is the one that is holy. Do you remember that when the angel was talking to Mary about the conception of the Lord Jesus Christ and about the birth of Jesus Christ. And then Mary was wondering, how will this be? Because I know not a man. See what the angel said in Luke chapter 1 verse 35. Because Jesus is the Holy One. And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee. And the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore, also that holy thing, that holy offering, holy offspring, that holy child that will be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. That means then the angels called him holy. But not only the angels called him holy, even the demons, the evil spirits referred to him as the Holy One. In Mark chapter 1, Mark chapter 1, verses 23 and 24. And there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Hast thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. The good angels, the holy angels, called him holy. And even the bad angels, the fallen spirits, the demons, they called him holy. And of course, men also called him holy. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 3. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 3, verse 14. But she denied the Holy One and the Jaws and desired a murderer to be granted unto you. And then as you find in Hebrews chapter 7, you find that Jesus Christ 
possesses this characteristic is holy, is faithful, is true, is sinless, is blameless. In, in Hebrews chapter 7, Hebrews chapter 7, reading from verse 25, it says, Wherefore he is able, referring to Jesus Christ, also to save them to the uttermost, that come unto God by him, seeing that he ever lived to make intercession for them, for such an high priest became us who is holy. This high priest, Jesus Christ, is holy and harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. You understand then that Jesus possesses absolute holiness. Absolute holiness. Angels called him holy. Demons called him the holy one. Men called him holy. Even his enemies said, I find no fault in him. That's the reason his sacrifice and atonement for our sins was acceptable to God. Because he was holy. He was righteous. He was spotless. He was sinless, pure, and perfect. And he who is holy has the divine power and the divine authority to demand holiness from us and also to provide for our Holiness. As you look at Revelation chapter 3, and you look at the characteristics of Christ, it's not only that he's holy, he's the one that is true. He that is true. He that is true. Let me remind you once again that that, uh, that um, phrase or that attribute is used for the almighty God. That is God the Father. If you look at Deuteronomy chapter 32, Deuteronomy chapter 32 verse 4, he is a rock. His work is perfect. For all his ways are judgment, a God of truth. And without iniquity, just and right, he is he. That is, this almighty God, that is the Father in heaven, is a God of truth. But that same attribute is used of Jesus Christ, just to buttress the fact and to convince you that Jesus Christ said, I and my Father are one. What you say in attribute, what you see of the Father, you see about me. That's why he said, he that has seen me has seen the Father. Turn your Bible to First John chapter 5. First John chapter 5, reading there in verse 20. First John chapter 5, verse 20. And we know that the Son of God is come and has given us an understanding that we may know him that is true. And we are in him that is true, even in his son Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Again, you'll find the attribute of Jesus mentioned there, that Jesus Christ is a true one, is holy and is true as well. In fact, in the gospel according to St. John alone, you have many references to the truthfulness of the Lord Jesus Christ. You turn your Bible to John chapter 1 verse 14. John chapter 1 verse 14 the word and the word was made flesh and he dwelt among us and we beheld his glory the glorious of the only begotten of the father full of grace and truth is full of grace and is also full of truth and every the adjective that qualifies him whatever you are thinking about him is the adjective true is a true one and he tells us in John chapter 6, John chapter 6, verse 32, it says, Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. Referring to himself, he is the true bread from heaven. In John chapter 14, John chapter 14, verse 6, it says, Jesus says unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The truth and the life. No man cometh unto the Father, but by me. It tells us in chapter 15, verse 1, I am the true vine. I am the true vine. And my Father is the husband man. And even at the time when he was being betrayed and he was being tried, that kind of uh, mock uh, trial, uh, you will find what he said about himself. And he were told in John chapter 18, verse 37, Pilate therefore said unto him, Are thou the king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born. And for this cause came I into the world, that I should be a witness unto the truth. That I should be a witness unto the truth, and everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. And that tells you then this great attribute about the Lord Jesus Christ that he is the true one. 
Christ is the one that is true. This characteristic is often referred to as we have seen in the New Testament because we are told that it's full of grace and truth. And the truth came by the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's the way, the truth, and the life. You have read his testimony already when he said, To this and for this purpose was I born. And for this cause I came into this world that I should be a witness unto the truth. And if you have the truth, then you'll follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Because everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. He said, He is the truth that sets us free from everything that is untrue, everything that is error, everything that is false, everything that is deceptive. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. Come back to Revelation chapter 3. You see what the Lord Jesus Christ is saying about himself. And he will introduce himself to the church, to this church in Philadelphia. You'll see that there's no threatening note here at all. Because there's nothing to threaten them about. No warning, no condemnation, and no blame, and no judgment at all. Everything is quite positive. And he says, he that has the key of David. He that has the key of David. If you've been here before, you've learned from Revelation chapter 1 that Jesus Christ said that same thing. If you look at Revelation chapter 1 verse 8, it says, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. It says, He has the key. By the way, what's he referring to when he says, I have the key? And when I open, no man can shut. And when I shut, no man can open. Actually, that is referring to a prophecy that had been given many years before at the time of Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 22. Isaiah chapter 22. You will know that many of the prophecies in the Old Testament, sometimes they are, connect, they are, they are connected with some narratives. That is, with some stories of some individuals that were told. And with those stories, then you bring out uh, some of the prophecies. And this is the prophecy that the Lord Jesus Christ is referring to. Um, Isaiah chapter 22, verse 22. But I'm going to back up to verse 20, so you will understand. And it shall come to pass in that day, that I will call my servant Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah. And the prophecy was being given now through the personality of the personage of Eliakim. And I will clothe him with thy robe and strengthen him with thy girdle. I will commit thy government into his son. And you know that this is somebody coming into the government and was going to rule the people. And he shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. Here comes the promise now. And the key of the house of David will I lay upon a shoulder so he shall open and none shall shut he shall shut and none shall open uh, the first immediate recipient of this promise and prophecy is this uh, Eliakim he was, uh, become, he was going to become a king when he became a king then he will have authority in that kingdom and then it is by his authority, his control, his declaration, his law, his edict that anybody will be able to do anything. And this is what the Lord Jesus is referring to. The key of the house of David. Will I lay upon his shoulder so that it shall open and none shall shut. It shall shut and none shall open. If you have heard from when we dealt with chapter 1 of Revelation, I told you at that time, when a mayor, when a judge, when a king came into a city, the people in that city will choose representatives and they will go and hand over the key to the gate of that city into the hands of that king or that mayor. The reason why they did that is to say, we give you the key. We we'll give you the control. We we'll give you the authority. You can open and then at your command will go out. At your command will come in. Whoever you accept into the city is accepted. Whoever you banish or reject and say cannot come into the city, cannot come into the city. That's exactly what the Lord Jesus Christ was saying to the church in Philadelphia. He said, I have the key of David. That means the treasure house of the almighty God. With unlimited riches, unlimited resources, the key is in my hand. And when I open for anyone to come in and enjoy those riches, the door is open. And even Satan cannot shut that door. And if I shut the door against evil and against sinners, that they cannot come in, then they cannot come in. Anyone that has the key 
of a house has unlimited access to that house. He who has the key to a palace has regal authority and regal control. Apply to Christ, then it means that he had absolute control in his kingdom. When people are to come into the kingdom of God, it is Jesus Christ that is the way and the truth and the life. And he is the door. He is the only one by whom you can come into the kingdom of God. And he has made the law. He has made the word. He has said, repent ye and believe the gospel. When you repent and you fulfill his condition and his terms, he opens the door for you and then you're coming. He says, I, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man opens for me, I will come in. And when you open the door of your heart, to him. Then he opens the door of the kingdom unto you because he has the key into the kingdom of God. He has absolute control in his kingdom with regard to admission into that kingdom or exclusion from that kingdom. But then it's not only that, he opens doors of opportunities for us to minister. And then when he opens that door, no man can shut the door. That's why a real Christian, the real child of God is not cringing before the people of the world, thinking that it's the people of the world that are going to open the door of opportunities and ministries for them. If God wants us to do that, then it will be done because he is the one that has the key, the key that opens the door. And then we're not afraid of witches and wizards and calamity and disease and pestilence and affliction and evil. Why? Because if he shuts the door, against all those things and he says no they cannot come into my church they cannot come into my kingdom they cannot come upon my people then the door is shut and no man can open that door that's the introduction that jesus gave concerning himself and when he does that it means that his is the final authority shutting the door closing the door or opening the door in job chapter 11 job Chapter 11, reading there from verse 7. It says, Canst thou, by searching, find out God? Canst thou find out the Almighty unto perfection? It is, a, it is as high as heaven. What canst thou do? Deeper than hell, deeper than the grave. What canst thou know? The measure thereof is longer than, than the earth and broader than the sea. Listen to this. If he cut off or shut up, or gather together, then who can hinder him? That's final authority. Total authority. Complete authority. When he does one thing, who can challenge his authority? In Job chapter 12, reading from verse 13 and verse 14. With him is wisdom and strength. He has counsel and understanding. Behold, he breaketh down and it cannot be built again. That's final authority, final control. He breaks down and none can build up again. He shutteth up a man and there can be no opening. And so the Lord Jesus Christ introduces himself to the church in Philadelphia. And he says, you have nothing to fear. Because you are faithful, I set an open door before you. Let's go back. Let's go to point number two. The Christian's purity, perseverance, and consecration. We're looking at Revelation chapter 3, reading from verse 8. I know thy works. That's what he always says. I know thy works. If those works are good, I know them. If those works are bad, I know them. You might hide them from human beings, but I know them. You may not be able to, you may not be willing to open your mouth and tell even the closest person to you, but you cannot hide them from the Lord Jesus Christ. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and thou hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews, and are not. But do lie. Behold, I will make them to come, and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. Because thou hast kept the watch of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell on the upon the earth and those are the things that jesus said to this church and you'll find there's commendation here you'll find there's counsel here you'll find there is promise here you'll find there's prophecy here as well pick them up one by one i know thy works behold i have set before thee an open door and no man can shut it now he said i've set before you an open door already he said i have the key your destiny is in my hand, and your life is my, in my hand. 
opportunity for ministry is in my hand. You, you don't have to look to any other person. You don't have to cringe and beg and crawl and, and you know, compromise before you can have opportunities because I'm pleased with you. I'm happy with you. The Lord was saying to this church and he said, I've set before you already an open door and no man no man anywhere, either in your city or outside your city, can shut that door. And when Jesus said, I've set an open door before you, what did he mean by that? Let scripture explain scripture. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 9, it says, For a great door, an effectual is opened unto me, and there are many adversaries. And here Paul the apostle was saying, A lot of things are going on here. The work of God is just progressing. Opportunities to preach, opportunities to minister, opportunities for outreach. The white, the great door, effectual door, is opened unto me. And then he said, Can you imagine this? There are many adversaries, and then the doors are still open. The door of opportunity is still open. Adversaries are there, enemies are there, oppressors are there, persecutors are there, but that doesn't stop the door being open. A great and effectual door is open unto me. All the same, in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12. Furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, and a door was opened unto me of the Lord. He said, A door was opened unto me by the Lord. It was the Lord that opened the door, not man. And it wasn't anybody that forced it open. You know the mistake we make many times we, even those of us who say we're Christians and even ministers. When the door is closed, we do not allow the Lord to open the door. We do not wait until the Lord opens the door. We kick it open. You say, to, if it will not open, I'll kick it open. But you know you cannot do that. Even if you do that, you are wasting your time because when God shuts a door, there is no force of man and there is no wisdom of man that can make it open. That's what the people of the world do. They think that they can great crash. They, they think they can force their way into whatever they want, but not in the kingdom of God. In Colossians chapter 4, Colossians chapter 4, reading from verses 3 and 4, Without praying also for us that God would open unto us a door of utterance. We can pray and then God will open the door. We cannot open the doors ourselves. Doors of opportunity. Doors of ministry. Doors of service. It is the Lord that opens the door. You'll find that sometimes there are some churches that will be using some political methods. And those political methods is like uh, they feel that we have talent and they are not recognizing the talent of this church. We have ability. And these other churches are not recognizing the ability of this church. And we have the, we have the, the strength and the capacity and the spiritual gifts to do this. And they are not recognizing the gifts we have to do what we ought to do. Therefore, we're going to keep the door open, whether they like it or not. Why is it that church that is always getting that opportunity? We are going to get it done. Well, if you do that, you're just doing what Jesus said you cannot do. And here Paul, the apostle, said, yes, we have the gifts, yes, we have the consecration, yes, we have the passion, yes, we have the seal, but you have to pray now that God will open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am also in bonds. I'm asking you a question now. Do you allow the Lord to open doors for you or do you kick the doors open? What are they doing that I cannot do? What are they preaching I cannot preach? Why are they choosing them to do that thing? Can't I do it also? If they don't recognize my ability, I'm going to get it done by myself. Then there will be no reward. Wait for the Lord. When he opens the door, nobody can shut that door. And do you know some people will say, you know who is not allowing me to do the work of God? Do you know that you know reason why I don't have the opportunities I ought to have? It's because of brother so-and-so. Because if it were not for brother so-and-so or sister so and so I know I would have been given that opportunity no when God opens the door brother so and so cannot shut it and sister so and so cannot shut it therefore just relax and rest in the Lord look up to the Lord let him open the door and then you'll be able to go in we we'll come back to Revelation chapter 3 and verse 8 for thou hast a little strength and hast kept my word and has not denied my name. He said, you have a little strength. Now, don't let that uh, deceive you when he said, you have a little strength. Well, he said little because uh, that's what the people were saying. It's a little church. 
fear not little flock. It is my father's pleasure to give you the kingdom. Oh, that little church, that little church, what do they have? What do they know? And what can they do? You have a little strength. So the Lord Jesus Christ was using the language that they themselves might be using for themselves. And they might be saying, what can we do after all? We have just a little strength. Just a little strength. I'm just a little fellow in my little corner here. Little strength. You have a little strength, but I found faithfulness in you. I found loyalty in you. I found perseverance in you. Loyalty faithfulness, perseverance, even though you have a little strength. Are we surprised? No, not at all. We're told in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 26. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men, not many, not many wise men according to the flesh, not many mighty and not many noble are called, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound them that the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound them that are mighty and the base things of the world and the things that are despised that for, has God chosen, yea, and the things which are not, to bring to naught the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. All you have is a little strength, but the, the glory of it is that this little strength has helped you, and you have kept my word. Well, you don't have any excuse then. I'm not too strong. I have a little strength. You can still keep the word of God. I am not, I'm not strong. I have a little strength. You, cannot, you can still do your restitution. I have a little strength. You can still be obedient. I have a little strength. You can still hold on to the name of Christ because it says here, you have a little strength. And here is my commendation that you have kept my word and you have not denied my name. It's a little strength, but you are pulling it through. And through that little strength, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Actually, when it says little, you need to understand that the foolishness of God is wiser than men. And the little strength, if it has divine power, divine energy within it, is greater and stronger than the strongest of men. Because we're told in Matthew chapter 17. Matthew chapter 17, reading from verse 20. And Jesus said unto them, because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, just little faith, little faith, if it has divine energy within it, if it has divine power, divine life within it, if you have just faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, remove hands to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Little strength, little faith, if it has God within it, behind it, supporting it, it can still be mighty, because little is mighty when God is in it. It's just like that little divine faith. It will move mountains, and you'll find nothing impossible a little divine strength will make you to do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Faithfulness with the little that we have will open a door of more opportunities in ministry for us. And then look at what it says in verse, in verse 8. It says, Thou hast kept my word and has not denied my name. You jump down to verse 10, because thou hast kept the word of my patience. It says, you have persevered. When the heat was turned on, when the pressure was about crushing you, you still were faithful, dependable, and loyal, and you did not give up. You were persevering. You kept my word, even though it's a little strength you think you have, and it's a little strength that people think that you have. Look at the promise that he gave in verse 9. He says, Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved you. He's saying that the people, their enemies, their persecutors, and the people that will say what will those people amount to. They are just a little congregation and they just have a little strength. What can they do? We're going to crush them and we're going to rule over them. The Lord is saying that was giving them a promise that they were going to rule over those enemies and those persecutors. In fact, he said they were coming to bow down before them eventually. That's the kind of promise uh, the Jews were given in Isaiah chapter 49. Isaiah chapter 49. 
Reading from verse 23. And kings shall be thy nursing fathers, and their queens thy nursing mothers. They shall bow down to thee with their face toward the earth, and lick up the dust of thy feet. And thou shalt know that I am the Lord, for they shall not be ashamed that wait for me. This promise is what the Lord Jesus Christ was giving to the church in Philadelphia. But this church in Philadelphia, they were gentle people. But the Jewish people that said were of the seed of Abraham. And these people were greater than them. But Jesus said they might be Jews in the natural, in the physical. They might be descendants of Abraham in the natural. But they are not Jews in the spiritual. Therefore, in that case, it says, which say they are Jews and are not because they do lie. I will make them to come down and bow before you and wash you before thy feet and then they will know that I have loved you. And that's why real Christians who know the promises of God, they're not afraid about persecutors because all those persecutors, they are coming to worship and bow down before the feet are the feet of the people that really love the Lord. But the qualification is you are loyal, you are faithful, you are dependable, you are persevering. You stay with the Lord. You do not deny the name of the Lord in a time of pressure in a time of persecution and then it says that the unbelievers are going to bend and bow before you eventually Isaiah chapter 60 verse 14 Isaiah chapter 60 verse 14 still the same promise that the Lord has given to his son it says the sons also of them that afflicted thee shall come bending unto thee and all they that despise thee shall bow themselves down at the soles of thy feet and they shall call thee the holy city the holy the city of the lord the zion of the holy one of israel they'll bow themselves before you cast themselves down even before you you see this church that we're reading about the church in philadelphia intense persecution had come on that church from professing religious people making false claims but the church had remained loyal to the cause of Christ the Lord promised to subdue all their enemies the enemies of truth under his faithful people he was going to prove his love to these consecrated people for all to see and he will protect them and preserve them these pure persevering people from the trouble that was to come look at revelation chapter 3 again we're looking at verse 10 revelation chapter 3 looking at verse 10 it says because thou hast kept the word of my patience i also will keep thee from the hour of temptation which shall come on all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Look at this promise very well. It's not a promise that is hanging in the air. You see, there are some people, when they look at the promises of God, they just say, I claim the promise. I claim the promise. That's for me. That's for me. I'll not allow anybody to take it away from me. Now, this promise was not hanging in the air. It has a basis. It has a foundation in verse 10. Because this is a reason. That's the foundation. That's the condition. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience. That means because you have kept the word of my perseverance. The way I persevered, you have persevered in the same way. You have followed the example of my perseverance. You have followed the commandments of my perseverance. You have followed the word of my perseverance. The word perseverance there actually could have been translated perseverance. Patience, perseverance. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, the word of my perseverance, just because of that, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell on the earth. Now, as, as you look at this temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them, to test them that dwell upon the earth, what do you understand by that? This is talking about a final time of trial, a final time of testing. It's a final time of trouble. It's referred to in the Old Testament as the time of Jacob's trouble. It's referred to in another place as a great temptation, uh, as the great tribulation. Look at this. It says, number one, it is future. I will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come. Not there yet, but it's coming. It's coming. It shall come. It's future. Number two, it is limited because it's called the hour 
of temptation. It will be a brief moment in comparison to the whole age of the church, to the whole period of the church. Number three, it will be a worldwide thing because it says there are temptation which shall come upon all the world. It's inclusive. It's a whole world, wide world, to try them that dwell on the earth. Try them, test them, punish them that dwell on the earth. That phrase, dwell on the earth, what does that mean? It means the world of unbelievers. Every time you see that in the revelation them that dwell upon the earth is referring to the unbelievers the world of unbelievers look at this revelation chapter 6 verse 10 them that dwell on the earth them that dwell on the earth revelation chapter 6 verse 10 and he cried with a loud voice saying how long O lord holy and true dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth those are the people that kill the people of god and these people of god they are now in heaven and they are saying oh lord how long will you not judge those people and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth that phrase then dwell on the earth is referring to unbelievers living on earth at the time of the great tribulation in chapter 8 verse 13 Revelation chapter 8 verse 13 and I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven saying with a loud voice woe, 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 that means curse that means punishment, that means indignation and wrath of God on the inhabitants of the earth them that dwell on the earth the inhabitants of the earth in chapter 11, Revelation chapter 11 reading verse 10 and they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts Gives one to another because these two prophets tormented them that dwell on the earth. When those prophets of the great tribulation period, when they preach unto them, they bring the judgment of God upon them. They are able to call fire down. Eventually, when they kill them, then they rejoice and send gifts to one another because these two prophets tormented them that dwell on the earth. Revelation chapter 13 verse 8, it says, And all, the, all that dwell on the earth shall worship him, whose name he are not written in the book of life, of the Lamb. Uh, you do see here slain from the foundation of the world. It says them that dwell on the earth, they'll worship that beast, they'll worship the Antichrist. Those are the sinners, the unbelievers. It's talking about the time of the great tribulation and Jesus was promising the church of Philadelphia. That is, any church like that of Philadelphia, pure, holy, righteous and true, faithful and dependable and persevering, I will not allow you to go through that hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell on the earth. In verse 12, and he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him and causes the earth and them that dwell therein the earth and dwell the, them that dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. It's still referring to the people of the world. Um, reading all this to you so that you will understand that when it says them that dwell on the earth, it's referring to the unbelievers, it's referring to the sinners. In Revelation chapter 17 verse 8, 17 verse 8, and the beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into the perdition and they that dwell on there shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is so then you understand revelation chapter 3 come back to revelation chapter 3 when it says that he was going to preserve he was going to protect it was going to take away the people of God from the hour of testing, the hour of trial, the hour of tribulation, which will come upon all the world. It was given the promise that the people of God will not go through the great tribulation. They will not go through the great tribulation because we are told in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 9, For God has not appointed us to us, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. We come now to point number three. The concourse position as a pillar and his crown. The concourse position and as a pillar and his crown. We come to Revelation chapter 13. Reading from verse 11. Behold, I come quickly. Behold that fast without hast. 
that no man take thy crown. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. And he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God. And the name of the city of my God. Which is New Jerusalem. Which cometh down out of heaven. From my God. And I will write upon him my new name. He that has an ear let him hear. What the spirit saith unto the churches. Here we find what the Lord promised these, uh, these uh, faithful people. These persevering people. When he says. Behold, I come quickly. He always announced that. I come quickly. Because the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ is imminent. He will come. And is coming very soon. Coming suddenly, coming soon. Coming certainly, night or noon. Because we know that that is what he has promised. Jesus Christ repeatedly assured us that he will be coming again. And you find that both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. That Jesus Christ, yes, he came the first time, but he will come again. And when he comes, he will reward every man according to his, uh, according to his works. According to the knowledge he has about every believer's faithfulness and loyalty and consecration and perseverance. Let's see the certainty of his coming. Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, reading from verse 37. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 37. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come, and he will not tarry. For yet a little while, he that shall come will come. That's referring to the Lord Jesus Christ. And he will not tarry at the appointed time in God's timetable. He will come. Then he says, Now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them that draw back unto perdition. Those who draw back, they draw back to perdition. But of them who believe to the saving of the soul. Coming quickly. Coming suddenly. Coming certainly. In Revelation chapter 22. The last chapter of this revelation, of this book of revelation, it repeats three times all over. I'm coming again, I'm coming again, I'm coming again. Very soon, imminent return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Revelation chapter 22 verse 7. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the saints of the prophecy of this book. Before he closes, he tells us in verse 12 again. Behold, I come quickly. And my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. And then in verse 20, he would testify these things, say, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. The Lord is coming. Because he's coming, what's he telling us to do? Come back to Revelation chapter 3, verse 11. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. What's he saying? Hold it fast. Because the danger is that if you don't hold it fast, there's a devil that wants to make you lose your steadfastness. Because if you don't hold it fast, there are false prophets all around that want you to lose that steadfastness and vigilance. That's why he says, hold it fast so that no man will take your crown. If there was no danger that you could lose your reward and lose your crown, why will Jesus Christ be giving warning when there was no danger? It means there is danger. Hold it fast. Hold it firm. That thing that is committed to you so that no man will take your crown. He tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1, reading from verse 13 and verse 14. 2 Timothy chapter 1, reading from verse 13 and verse 14. It says, Hold that old fast, the form of sound words, which thou hast said of me in faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. It said, Hold fast. The form of sound words. That's referring to the sound doctrine that you have. You know, there are some people that feel that once you have sound doctrine, you will have it until the end of your life. No. If you don't hold it fast, you can lose it. If you are careless with it, it can be taken away from you. But to hold it fast is a commandment. It's an injunction. And it is, it is compelling upon us. Hold it fast. Hold it firm. So that your, nobody will take it from you. You have had it from me. It's in faith. And in love, which is in Christ Jesus, verse 14, that good sin which, that, which was committed unto thee. Hold, keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. First Timothy chapter 6, verse 20 and verse 21. Timothy, and you can 
you can put your name there. Keep that which is committed to thy trust. Avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science, falsely so called, which some professing have urged concerning the faith. Grace be with thee. Then he tells us in Revelation chapter 2. Here are the words of Jesus Christ again. He says, show us the importance of holding fast that which the Lord has given you. You've got salvation, hold it fast. You've got this holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Hold it fast. Not only that, not just the experience of holiness, but you've got the doctrine and the message of holiness. Hold it fast. Because there are people that will want you to drop that message drop that conviction and drop that experience in revelation chapter 2 verse 25 it says but that which ye have already hold fast till i come what you have got hold it fast until the lord will come because it's not enough to say i got it before i had it before are you having it now in chapter 2 verse 10 fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and, uh, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Uh, the Lord is challenging us, and the Lord is reminding us that we need to keep what the Lord has given unto us. Then he says that no man take thy crown. That is, if you hold fast what you have got, then there is a crown that awaits you on the final day. In Second Timothy chapter two. Second Timothy chapter two, reading from verse one. It tells us in verse one, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Uh, you remember he had given him a commandment in chapter chapter six, verse twenty, keep that which is committed to thy trust. He repeated that commandment another way, chapter two. Uh, chapter 1 of 2 Timothy verse 13, hold fast the form of sound words. Timothy, how are you going to be able to do that? By being strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things which thou hast heard of me, among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. Therefore, thou endure hardness. There will be tough times. There will be persecution. There will be affliction. You endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Remember Timothy and remember everyone. No man that worries entangles himself with the affairs of this life. That he may please him who has chosen him to be a soldier. And if a man also strive for masteries, yet you see not crowned except a strive lawfully. He wants us to go on till the end so that we'll not lose the crown, we'll not lose the reward that the Lord has provided for his own. In First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17. It tells us, Then we which are alive, the time is coming when the rapture is going to take place. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord ever be with the Lord please come back to Revelation chapter 3 and now we look at the promise that the Lord gives the overcomers it says in verse 12 chapter 3 verse 12 him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God he who overcomes he who overcomes you overcome the flesh he that overcome, uh, you, that overcometh, you overcome the devil. He that overcometh, you overcome all secret sins. He that overcometh, you overcome all the pressures and the persecution that is trying to come against your life to make you to lose your conviction. He that overcometh, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. What does that mean? I'll give him permanent residence. As the pillars are permanent, permanently resident in the temple so I will make him, I will give him permanent residence with my God he will have eternal citizenship in the courts of heaven, in the kingdom of God, he shall go no more out permanent, eternal, everlasting he shall go no more out and I will write upon him my new name the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, it means that I will make him my possession, if you remember when our children were very very young there were some parents that uh, whenever the children were going to 
the children's church, or if the children were going to a, kind, a large crowd, what they will do is that they will write uh, the name of the parents, uh, Mr. So-and-so, Brother So-and-so, Sister So-and-so. They'll write that name and put it on that child, maybe hang it on the neck, so that anybody that sees that child will know that this child belongs to Brother So-and-so, Sister So-and-so. And if you're looking for that child in the crowd, they'll be able to see that thing you're hanging on the child because that child belongs to you. And Jesus is saying, if you overcome, if you remain faithful to the end, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to write the name of my God upon you. So that when the angels see you in heaven, they have no doubt at all that this one belongs to the Lord. And he has permanent residence and eternal citizenship in heaven. And then he says this beautiful thing. He says, and then I will write upon him my new name. That will mean that I approve him eternally. I confess him eternally. And anybody that sees my name, sees my authority, sees my approval upon him will know that he belongs to me forever and ever. The Lord is telling us that if we're faithful to the end, the time is coming, temptation will end, and persecution will end, and all these pressures upon our lives will end, and then we'll have eternal citizenship, permanent residence in the very presence of the Almighty God in heaven. The Lord has spoken a lot to us today. He's shown us his own attributes, holy and true. He's shown us that he has a key of David and that he opens and no man can shut. He shuts and no man can open. And he tells us that if we are faithful and we are persevering, he's going to set an open door before us which no devil or man can shut. And even though we might have a little strength, he says that little strength can carry us through. And we shall be able to do all things through Christ who strengthens us. He even gives us a promise that all our enemies and all our persecutors, they are going to come to bow before us and they will know that he has loved us. He says if we keep on keeping this word of patience, this word of perseverance, it's going to keep us away from the great tribulation that is going to come upon all this world and he's telling us it will not be long. I'm coming very quickly, I'm coming very soon. Whatever trials we are going through, whatever difficulties we are going through, it will soon be over. Hold on to what you have got, the experiences and the Christian faith you have got, hold it fast so that nobody will take your crown. You have been overcoming, you have been persevering. The little time, the short time that remains, if you overcome till the end, I'll give you a permanent residence in the courts of the Almighty God, in heaven, in the abode of God. Then he says, See that has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. Our prayer is, God will give us ears to hear. And all that we have heard will do good in our lives in Jesus' name. And the grace to hold on to the end the Lord will give unto us. Let's rise up now and pray for more of that grace. That God will help you to remain holy and victorious and overcoming all through to the end of your life. So that these promises the Lord has given, none of us will miss the benefit of the promises of God. Talk to the Lord. He has enough grace to give unto you so that you will persevere unto the very end. He helped the church in Philadelphia. He can help you. He can help your family. He can help our church too.